Thank you. Barnett Newman is best known for his monumental wide canvases broken by towering, slender, over life-sized verticals, which came to be known as zips. But Newman also made sculptures. His first effort in the medium on the left, here one, fashioned out of plaster and wood in 1950, was eventually bronzed a dozen years later. Two other Newman sculptures were created during the latter years of his life, around 1965. The one on the right is here too. And he also did here three, fashioned out of rusted Corten steel and shiny stainless steel, respectively. All three works consist of isolated but three-dimensional vertical elements, single or clustered, and poised on a rectangular base. If the first of these sculptures presents the ragged edges of a painted Newman zip, the latter two works in the series have substituted polished surfaces and monolithic presence. Mere inches wide, they stand some nine or ten feet tall, towering slender shafts anchored on mastaba-like slanted rectangular plinths, and they intensify the upright pose of a human, even as they serve, like the vertical zips of the same height that divide Newman's largest canvases, to mark a location in an otherwise open field of undifferentiated space. With additional irregular edges inserted beneath the bases of his sculptures, Newman further suggests a kind of broken continuity, as if the sculptures themselves were arbitrarily cut out of spatial extension to mark their specific site. This is here number three. Here three even asserts itself more positively with a single reflective bright and shiny surface of stainless steel. More impressively, here three is a lone vertical. It sits on a tightly contracted base that barely extends beyond its own margins. The overall shape of the third isolated shape reminded Harold Rosenberg of the letter I and the number one, as if to assert individual integrity as what Rosenberg called a primal sign. Together, these three works and their common title here point us to a powerful <coughs> generative idea present in Newman's work more generally, the concept of place. The sculptural presence of place is underscored even further by Newman's fourth sculpture, Broken Obelisk, 1963 to 1967. In that work, he fuses two primal Egyptian forms, the pyramid and the obelisk, both markers of place and historical memory and also the solid monuments that historically succeeded mastabas at Egyptian temple sites. Within the development of Newman sculptures, the vertical obelisk form adds volume to the earlier flat slabs of the here series. As a solid, that vertical obelisk also appears within extended physical space to mark a particular place. It provides the same significant function of punctuation in his spatial uh, configuration as the zips do on Newman's wide canvas expanses. Here Newman inverted and broke the obelisk form, seemingly balancing it precariously on a, on a single point atop a supporting pyramid. As in the here series, he uses its fragmentary form above as an ellipsis, which suggests simultaneously that the obelisk is a crucial but excerpted form from the very top of its fully extended and possibly infinite iconic form, or else a broken torso that connotes violent damage to its integrity. Of course, the peak of any obelisk already culminates in a pyramid of its own, so Newman's pyramidal base could also be read as if it extended downward into the earth atop its own colossal obelisk. Even at this relatively modest scale, therefore, the entire sculptural composition of broken obelisks can imply the same gargantuan scale as surviving ancient Egyptian pyramids and obelisks. This implied gigantism suggests an effort to convey awe and sublimity, produced by great antiquity as well as by the implied scale. Thus, with broken obelisk, Newman more deeply underscores his sculpture as the marker of a significant place. Newman's massive final sculpture, Zim Zoom, 1969, now in the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, pairs six Corten steel plates, eight feet high and 15 feet long, standing without a base while folded like two screens with a central passageway 
That's a little easier to make out on the right slide. It echoes an earlier design that Newman had made for windows in a synagogue model for a 1963 exhibition. The two sides are complementary, where the right angle points on one side, let me go back to it, where the right angle points on one side uh, face the angled open areas opposite them. That's why it looks like a, a continuous solid in the left slide. Thus, this piece of sculpture as architecture creates its own setting by activating its own charged interval and towering like a pair of enclosing walls, but appearing capable of folding inward or outward. The viewer is invited to enter between the screens and to experience their enfolding presence. The artist himself discussed his unusual choice of name, noting that it refers to a Kabbalistic understanding of God's creation of the universe as a voluntary self-diminution or contraction. Thus, the forms can be read as already in the process of contracting in Tzimtzum's dynamic zigzag form. Writing about his synagogue design, Newman placed, discussed that place as a site where ceremony creates, and I quote, creates the subjective experience in which one feels exalted. Know before whom you stand, reads the command. The synagogue is more than just a house of prayer. It is a place, makom, where each man can be called up to stand before the Torah to read his portion. Under the tension of that tzimtzum, the created light and the world, he can experience a total sense of his own personality before the Torah and his name. End of quote. This statement by Newman himself goes on to be even more explicit about the role of place. Let me show you a drawing of um, now at Harvard of Newman's um, concept of the space from the outside of the synagogue. So if we talk about Jewish place then in Barnett Newman's creative thinking, we need to hear his words again, and I quote, my purpose in this synagogue is to create a place, not an environment. For the sake of that ultimate courtesy where each person, man or woman, can experience the vision and feel the exaltation of, and this is a quote within the quote, his trailing robes filling the temple, end quote. Newman's planned sanctuary deliberately resembles the form of ancient synagogues also repeated in the chapel of Hadassah Hospital in Jerusalem, famous for its Chagall stained glass windows. Thomas Hess also invokes the concept of place in interpreting the Newman Synagogue, and I quote Thomas Hess, Makom is the place, the locus where man stands face to face with the Torah, with the word, with white fire and black fire. It is a mound reminding us of Newman's epiphany at the mound builder's sanctuary near Akron, and also of the mounds into which are thrust the vertical elements in his first sculpture here, number one, end of quote. Moreover, Newman himself expressly connected place with the essence of existence. In an interview of 1965 with David Sylvester, Newman declared, another quote, painting should give man a sense of place, that he knows he's there, so he's aware of himself, because in that sense, I was there. Standing in front of my paintings, you had a sense of your own scale. To me, the sense of place not only has a mystery, but has that sense of metaphysical fact. End quote. So to use the term here as a title indicates a place of personal location, often named, in order to convey its saturation with transcendent meaning and to mark off, in contrast, its specific location against otherwise unbounded openness and undifferentiated extension elsewhere, the distinction between place and space. This kind of declarative utterance as a speech act has great force. It's the same kind of speech act that Brigham Young used to declare with the force of spiritual revelation to his followers in 1847 about Salt Lake City that this is the place. Today on that place in Salt Lake City, there's a monument which stands to mark that very spot and they call it Heritage Park. It's the spiritual center of the Mormon faith. Crucially, in traditional Jewish sources, makom, Hebrew for place, also is used as one of the names of God, which the Midrash defines as the place of the world in Genesis Rabbah. Jewish religious thought, liturgy, and customs construct a concentric concept of the world through a hierarchy of sanctities, 
with a center of belief located in the Holy Land, or once in the Holy of Holies in the Temple on the Mount. Divinely chosen and mandated as sacred, whether specifically at Jerusalem or within Jerusalem at the Temple precinct, climaxing in the Holy of Holies. Their powerful ceremonies defined a separated center essential to a religion. As Jonathan Z. Smith notes, the touchstone biblical passage for the ideal vision of the Jerusalem temple as a cultic place is found in Ezekiel, chapters 40 to 48. There the temple is described as a precinct separated by placement on a high mountain and isolated further by a thick wall with controlled access through specific and narrowing gates and up steps to a platform on which is placed on a central axis with pillars, themselves named as Boaz and Yachin, on either side of the porch, the Holy of Holies. This, and this is uh, described in the uh, First Kings 7 and, uh, and Second Kings 11 and 23. The Ezekiel text also distinguishes place according to separation of sacred from profane, of pure from polluted, and priest chambers stand before the innermost room of the temple, filled from the east with the glory of the Lord, but thereafter perpetually closed. In the later passages of Ezekiel, chapters 47 and 48, the land of Israel itself is allotted to the 12 tribes, but special precincts within each are set aside for the Levites and priests, further reasserting sacred hierarchy. The rituals themselves are spelled out in Ezekiel 46. And finally, in the last line of the prophecy, Ezekiel 48, verse 35, sacred space is reasserted through and acquainted with the divine name. And this is from Ezekiel. And the name of the city henceforth shall be the Lord is there. This conjunction, then, of God with his holy city is spelled out explicitly in other places in the Bible. Zechariah 8, verse 3. Thus says the Lord, I will return to Zion and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and Jerusalem shall be called the faithful city and the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. By extension, after the destruction of the temple, ultimately by the Roman Empire in 70 CE, and here's that image. Jews were displaced from their homeland center into a galut, or diaspora. By historical tradition and Jewish memory, the Holy Land itself is what God expressly told Abraham in Genesis that would be the land that I will show you. It's also the land from and to which Jacob always aligned himself, whether while away on travels or back at the actual place where he dreamed of the divine ladder, named there as Beth El for the Lord, as he declared, surely the Lord is present in this place. Newman thus strove to provide an artistic reconnection with just this kind of originating primal experience of, Ju of specifically Jewish sacral power through his own artistic recreation of place in his sculptures and by extension in his paintings. And that is Newman in front of one meant number six. Elsewhere, Newman opined that the, quote, the issue is one of scale, and scale is a felt thing, end quote. But he also instructed on the explicitly painterly qualities of his surfaces. He instructed viewers to his exhibition in 1951 at the Betty Parsons Gallery in New York to confront his paintings up close. He said, quote, there is a tendency to look at large pictures from a distance, the large pictures in this exhibition are intended to be seen from a short distance." End quote. Certainly large scale, particularly breadth, but also height, characterizes Newman's massive painted canvases, which create a powerful, expansive presence before any viewer whose standing position before them is established or confirmed by the vertical zips within the field. Significantly, one of Newman's first painted images to emphasize this dialectic using a newly widened and more assertive zip placed to the left of the central axis, but with its right edge firmly centered, bore the title Abraham, 1949, for its dark black-on-black -black composition. In addition to being the principal founding Jewish patriarch, Abraham was also the name of Newman's father, and he died just before then, in 1947. So the dark tonality could be a more personal family memorial 
while also being an evocation of the nocturnal trial of Abraham, the binding of his beloved son Isaac in the Akedah. Significantly, too, Abraham contributed to the fundamental Jewish sense of place. The Temple Mount in Jerusalem is traditionally considered to be the site of Mount Moriah, where the binding provided the acid test of Abraham's faith and a reassertion of his direct dialogue with the divine. Genesis 22 expressly invokes the Hebrew word makom in verses 3 and 9 during this heart-wrenching episode, suggesting the essential link between the mountain height and the presence of divinity at that place of which God has told him. Newman followed up his Abraham, as if in counterpoint, with a white-on-white -white painting called The Voice, 1950, now in the Museum of Modern Art in New York, which alludes to communication with the divine, perhaps more specifically to that call by God to Abraham to arise and bind Isaac for sacrifice, but also to the divine voice at other significant moments and places, whether the creation itself or Mount Sinai. Thomas Hess also notes, following Gershom Sholem on Kabbalah, that the Jewish mystic hears a voice speaking from the celestial fire, as if he were standing before the throne of heaven. Newman goes on to add expressly Jewish titles prominently in many of his other early large canvases. This one is called The Promise this one, Covenant. Though, of course, uh, the former title of the promise is more general. The covenant itself between Abraham and God from Genesis 17 provides the formative moment for the Jewish people and the promise of the Holy Land for future generations. And I will give to you and to your descendants after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. In 1950, his Joshua, in a private collection in Chicago, refers, according to Thomas Hess, not only to the victorious Hebrew general in the conquest of the Holy Land, but also to the reconfirmation of the original covenant of God with the Hebrew people to ensure their acceptance of the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai and their final transformation into Israelites. Gathering the people at Shechem, Joshua reprises their history from the time of Abraham in the name of God, re-emphasizing their physical possession of the Holy Land of Canaan and compelling them to faithful obedience with these words. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. And then did the people reaffirm their faith. The Lord our God we will serve, and so forth. In 1950, the year that he first fashioned a sculpture, here at number one, Newman began to isolate his zips in tall, narrow frames. I show you two of them here. The one on the left is the only one with the title. It's called The Wild, and it's also in the Museum of Modern Art. But Newman also produced a 1951 painting, Cathedra, in the Stedelijk Museum in Amsterdam, eight by almost 18 feet, whose title points to that very throne of God the ultimate central place of the universe, ha Makom, as recounted in Isaiah's vision in chapter 6, verse 1. I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. That same quote, that phrase that the erudite Newman used to describe his synagogue model design in 1963, referring to how God's trailing robes filled the temple. Onto this massive canvas, Newman places two differently colored vertical guardians, the flanking seraphim of the prophet's vision, perhaps even an allusion to the columns of Boaz and Yachim, around squares in the deep ultramarine field. Although this work, uh, through this work, the viewer, like a mystic, but dwarfed by its scale, can still stand before the throne of God to contemplate its mystery. Well, certainly by now we've established the importance of place, and I would argue specifically of Jewish place and its strong association with God and the sacred in the sculpted and the painted art of Barnett Newman. But I'd like to introduce one other concept with its own fixed limit within undifferentiated expanse. In this case, time, singling out the moment to make a powerful appearance in the titles and the aesthetic experiences of Newman's Picture. Certainly, place can be singled out for its core of sacrality and separation linked to specific significant events. 
and their memory out of sight, but so can this fourth dimension of time also address memory and identity by capturing significant precise occasions of spiritual change, momentous in both senses of that word. But again, this is a charged moment, the issuing of a divine speech act declaring the separation of light from dark or the bestowing of the Torah to Moses and a sound and instant that defines place, the universe, Mount Sinai or Mount Moriah, with a divine call to Abraham, who replies significantly, Hineni, here I am, leads him to the future Temple Mount as the site of sacrifice. Newman addressed the issue of time in an early writing fragment, Prologue for a New Aesthetic. My paintings are concerned neither with the manipulation of space nor with the image, but with the sensation of time, not the sense of time, which has been the underlying subject matter of painting, which involves feelings of nostalgia or high drama. It is always associative and historical. Both Thomas Hess and Richard Schiff suggest the formative influence on Newman of a visit to a place of inspiration for him, the ancient Mississippian Indian mounds of Southern Ohio in August 1949. His title, The Wild, for that zip of 1950 originated from this experience. The artist wrote to Tony um, Smith, talk about art for the wild and in the wild, it's overwhelming. And let me conclude with a one last Newman quotation, which he wrote uh, it, near the end of his life in 1969 as a response to the art historian Reverend Thomas Matthews on, quote, the problem of religious content in contemporary art. Newman made his agenda as evident as he ever did, and here's what he said. What matters to a true artist is that he distinguish between a place and no place at all. And this feeling is the fundamental spiritual dimension. To my mind, the basic issue of a work of art, whether architecture, painting, or sculpture, is first and foremost for it to create a sense of place so that the artist and the beholder will know where they are. The Jewish medieval notion of makom is where God is. It's only after man knows where he is that he can ask himself, who am I and where am I going? And I think some places are more sacred than others. And that depends on the quality of the work of art, on its uniqueness, on its rigor. I said in 1950 that my entire aesthetic can be found in the Passover service. At the Passover Seder, which was also Jesus' last meal, the blessing is always made to distinguish between the profane and the sacred. That's the problem the artistic problem, and I think the true spiritual dimension. Thank you.